जय राध हरघ कुंज बिहे जय Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, third chapter, verse number 14, the title, Pure Devotional Service. 
सोनक उवाच ऋषि सोनक उवाच ईत्यम सोनक उवाच Sonic Uvacha Sonic said it thus abhivyaritam all that was spoken raja the king is samya by hearing bharata rishabaha maharaj pariksha <coughs> kim what anyat more pristavan did he inquire from him buya again vyasakim unto the son of vyasadev rishim one who is well versed kavim poetic Sonika said the son of Vyasadeva Srila Sukadeva Goswami was a highly learned sage who was able to describe things in a poetic manner what did maharaj prikshit again inquire from him after hearing all that he had said purport by shila prabhupad a pure devotee of the lord automatically develops all good qualities and some of the prominent features of those qualities are as follows he is kind peaceful truthful equable faultless magnanimous clean mild non-possessive a well-wisher to all satisfied 
surrender to Krishna without um, without hankering, simple, fixed, self-controlled, a balanced eater, sane, mannerly, prideless, grave, sympathetic, friendly, poetic, expert, and silent. Out of these 26 prominent features of a devotee, as described by Krishna Das Kaviraj in his Chaitanya Charitamrita, the qualification of being poetic is especially mentioned herein in relationship to Sukadev Goswami. The presentation of Srimad Bhagavatam by his recitation is the highest poetic contribution. contribution. He was a self-realized learned sage. In other words, he was a poet among the sages. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyana Janala Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tatsmai Shri Gurave Navaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhi Stam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pachardi Ne Never Se Sasunyavari Pastyatya Rezatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadahar Sivasadi Gorvaka Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So, here we see Sonika Rish is mentioning to the sages. Well, the sages, yeah, he's responding to the sages, actually. They want to know what else did the uh, Sukadeva Goswami say to Maharaj Pariksit. He had covered many subjects. He covered the six main questions that the sages had asked in the beginning of the first chapter and uh, in the first canto. He covered what is the goal of life, how to achieve the goal of life, what is the importance of inquiring about one's, uh, what we say, what is the most, uh, what is the most amazing thing? Uh, what is the what is the duty of about a person about to die? Covered many subjects. He'll cover much more as it goes on. But here, after answering all this, they want to hear more. What else did he ask? Because <laughs> they know Maharaj Pariksit. He only has seven days to live, and he's going to get as much mercy as he can in the form of transcendental knowledge which way he can fix his mind completely on the lotus feet of the Lord and achieve perfection by going back to Godhead. So this is an interesting point here because it's also very uh, relevant to us. Uh, we always want to know more. <laughs> it's not like, well, I have enough knowledge. You know, that's it. I don't need to question anymore. I don't need to ask. No, a devotee wants to know as much as possible. Uh, Prabhupada makes this point in Krishna consciousness that a devotee should um, is always inquisitive to learn more, to understand more, to uh, know more. In other words, <clears throat> there's an unlimited, uh, what we say, treasure house of transcendental knowledge. And the devotee is not satisfied. He wants to hear more and more and more. More topics about Krishna, more principles about the process of devotional service. He wants to be able to learn as much as he can because transcendental knowledge is a very tasty treat. It's sweet. It's one of the happinesses that devotees get in Krishna consciousness is hearing the glories of the Lord, repeating the glories of the Lord. And again, of course, also... Uh, distributing the glories of the Lord, or even the glories of the process of devotional service, the glories of the pure devotees of the Lord also. 
So this process of inquiring more and more, we see here, the whole Bhagavatam is an inquiry by Sukadeva Goswami to Sukadeva Goswami by Maharaj Pariksit. And he's just asking many, many questions. He's just asking more and more and more and more and more. And the sages, they want to hear more from Sanaka Rish. And this is a principle of devotional service. The devotee never says, well, I have enough. Prabhupada makes one statement in this regard. He said that, uh, you know, Lord Chaitanya visited so many holy places. He traveled all around South India. In fact, he, he went all the way down from Jagannath Puri across to the uh, western side and came down the western side and went all the way up the eastern side, all the way back to Jagannath Puri. It took him six full years. And when he did that, he, inv he visited many, many temples, hundreds of temples, uh, established his uh, Harinam Sankirtan and everywhere he went. And he made, uh, what we say, he made so many people devotees. In fact, it said the whole subcontinent of India was made for Krishna conscious envy by Lord Chaitanya's traveling everywhere. He's the Supreme Lord. Not only did he do that, but he made the animals sing and dance too. Prabhupada said, I've also done that in the form of my Western disciples. <laughs> They're coming from that kind of background. <laughs> Fortunately, there's a transformation <laughs> for the better. Uh, yeah, so the, what Prabhupada said in relationship to this is that the devotees should visit, this is an interesting, they should visit all the holy places that Lord Chaitanya visited. <laughs> so they have a lot of service to do yet. <laughs> Sometimes people think, well, that's not practical. But Prabhupada said that. You can hear it. You should visit all the holy places that Lord Chaitanya visited. Such powerful spiritual uh, energy comes out of these holy places. These holy places are as good as any other holy place because the Lord has vis personally visited. Wherever a pure devotee stays, and gives his, what we say, darshan to others. And wherever the Lord comes, leaves his transcendental dust from his lotus feet, that place is a tirtha. It's a place of pilgrimage, a place of purification. It's a place of great knowledge. <clears throat> so, yeah. So the main point we're trying to make is devotees can't get enough of Krishna consciousness. That's the thing. It's not like, well, I got enough. That's it. Next lifetime, I'll start again. <laughs> no. We have to, we want to get as much information, as much association, and as much opportunities to purify ourselves and to experience the, the, the wonder of Krishna consciousness. Now, this is, uh, this is the nature of a, an eager devotee. Here it's also mentioned the 26 qualities of a devotee. You can uh, understand how you're making progress in Krishna consciousness by using this as a means to understand how much you're advancing. Am I developing these qualities? Am I becoming kind? Am I peaceful? Am I always truthful? Am I equal to all? Do I have any faults? Am I clean? Do I really see my possessions as being simply Krishna's property that I use in his service? Do I, or else do I think it's my stuff? <laughs> uh, am I satisfied? Am I surrendered? Am I self-controlled? Do I eat more than I need? Am I grave? All these different qualities, there's 26 of it. The last one is silent. Sometimes that's mistaken to me, no, no speaking, but no, devotee is silent in a relationship to talking material things. But devotee is always active to be speaking about the glories of the Lord. So one who speaks about the glories of the Lord and the process of devotional service 
is considered to be silent. Silent in the sense that no, uh, no nonsense talk is coming out. <laughs> it's all beneficial. Prabhupada said, I can, there's a group of people who like to uh, say nothing. They carry a board around their neck and they put, and if they want to say something, they write on the board. Prabhupada said they're speaking anyway because they're writing it down, the same thing. We call them Moni Babas. And it was one sadhu, I forgot his name. He didn't speak for 25 years. Prabhupada said, yeah, probably didn't have anything to say. <laughs> but we have a lot to say. <laughs> we have a lot to say about Krishna or devotional service. So we are silent when it comes to material topics. So, yeah, so, but here it's also mentioned poetic. Devotee is also a poet. We see as the devotee becomes advanced in Krishna consciousness, they start dabbling in poetry. They start writing poetry. It's almost a natural thing. Sometimes it comes in the form of rhyme. Sometimes it becomes in the form of very nice poetic expressions, glorifying Krishna, glorifying the you can see if you have that tendency, it's an, it's an example that you're making nice advancement in Krishna consciousness. It comes naturally, this poetic. Here it mentions that of all the poetic expressions, the highest contribution to poetical, poetic literature is Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is, um, the verses in Bhagavatam are so poetically ex spoken by Sukadeva Goswami and they're full of meaning. Uh, not only full of meaning, but one cannot exhaust the meaning of the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam is non-different than Krishna. It's a transcendental expression of Krishna's uh, transcendental form. And therefore, the entire Bhagavatam is glorifying different parts of the Krishna's transcendental body. So these are some of the... Uh, qualities of the Bhagavatam. Um, Bhagavatam nasta prayeshu abhidreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhakti bhagavati nakshtaki that one should hear regularly uh, Bhagavatam every day. It's a daily regulation. It's a regulative principle. One should hear. If one happens not to go to the class or the class is not being held for so whatever reason, then one should uh, go to the electronic media and hear a class by Srila Prabhupada or one's spiritual master, like that. And that way, staying in contact with the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. And the verse goes on to explain that, uh, that by doing that, he then all, practically all of one's uh, material Tendencies are destroyed. Nasta Brayeshu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhakti Bhakti Nanaistiki. Almost everything of one's material tendencies is destroyed simply by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam every day. There's only a little trace left. And that can be easily removed through the continuation of the bhakti process. So this Bhagavatam is important. Read Bhagavatam, study Bhagavatam, recite Bhagavatam, uh, apply the teachings of Bhagavatam, and understand Bhagavatam more and more. It's a lifetime. Prabhupada was asked by one German professor, when Prabhupada was in Germany, on one morning walk, and he uh, was talking about Srimad Bhagavatam. And he said that actually there are 18,000 verses in Srimad Bhagavatam. And it takes one month to learn each verse. And then he turned to one of his devotees. He says, how long is that? 18,000 times one month, how many years is that? 
And the devotee was quite good in mathematics, and he said, that is 1,500 years, Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada said, yes, you have enough to learn. You have enough to read. <laughs> Just Bhagavatam alone is a lifetime adventure, what to speak about. We have so many other literatures, like Chaitanya Charitamrita, Nectar Devotion, Bhagavad Gita, Nectar Instructions, and many of the works of the Goswamis. It's an it's a ocean of transcendental devotion, and it just brings one transcendental satisfaction. Like yesterday, I was reading Bhagavatam, and I was just thinking, when I first came, I was reading Bhagavatam when I was at my previous residence. As soon as I moved here, somehow because of all the change and everything. <clears throat> I kind of eliminated in my in my day. I wasn't reading it regularly, so this went on for about a week or so, and maybe even a little more, two weeks. And I kept saying, "I gotta read Bhagavatam. Gotta read Bhagavatam again," because once you stop something, then again you gotta really make an effort to start it again. And once you start something, it's hard to stop it. <laughs> so I made an effort. I said, "All right." I got to do it. I'm going to put some time aside no matter what. Whatever else is important, forget it. And then I start reading Bhagavatam. I've been doing it for about three weeks now since I've been here. And it gives me it's something I look forward to every day. It's so satisfying to read it. And, of course, I take notes on it also while I'm reading. But I find it so very, what we say, satisfying. And when you finish reading, you feel like, wow, that was a feast. <laughs> that was a transcendental feast of nectar, transcendental nectar. So Bhagavatam is so powerful, so direct, and it's called Amalam Purana. That means it's free, free from all forms of Artha Kama, Dhamma, and Moksha, Artha Kama, Dharma and Moksha. It is uh, sometimes also called uh, uh, Paramahansa Samhita. It's meant for the highest forms of uh, swan-like personalities. It's not easy to understand. Only because of Srila Prabhupada's purports can we understand Bhagavatam. If you were to take this, the verses itself, and you would never be able to understand it. It's too difficult. It's very deep. Vedic literature is like that. It requires commentary by the great souls in order to bring out the meaning clearly. Because uh, people like to develop their own ideas of what the scripture says. They read and they think, oh yeah, this is what it means. And then they try to apply it. And then a lot of times they find that their application doesn't work, or at the same time they they make their own ideas on how what they what they should do in terms of applying it. They apply it when they want to, and they don't apply it when they don't want to. In other words, it becomes a mental speculating game of mental speculation this way and that way. But the bhakti Vedanta purports are actually the expressions of the verses in essence. And these these purports are so deep in knowledge, and by reading the purports, then the verse the verses become clearer and clearer here. And of course, you can never learn every every any any one verse without really studying it over and over again. That's why even if you hear the Bhagavatam over and over again, it's like hearing it for the first time. We all have that experience that uh, after some time, I think, oh, well, I read this before, but I don't remember reading this. <laughs> it's like that. You've read it, but you don't remember reading it because it's it hits you again in another way and brings out more meaning and more understanding. That's Bhagavatam. Shastra is what is called dynamic and material literature is called static. Static means you can read it 
and then finally you can understand it and you can't go any farther. There's no more meanings up to a certain point. Actual meanings. But Bhagavatam, the more you read it, the more meaning comes out, and the more you understand, and the more you read, the more you understand, and more meaning comes out. And it goes on. That's why Prabhupada said, Prabhupada was saying, uh, he was saying to one, uh, one disciple, if you simply read one, one page of any of my books, you can be, he was talking about nectar devotion. If you read one page of nectar devotion, you can become fully Krishna conscious. And then, then Prabhupada said, no, if you read simply one paragraph, you can become Krishna conscious. Then he said, no, actually, if you read one sentence, you can be fully Krishna conscious. Then he said, if you understand one word, you can be Krishna conscious. You can, you can, I've heard that spoken. The person who spoke it didn't want me to tell their name. They were a little bit embarrassed because Prabhupada was chastising them <laughs> at the same time. But that was the point that this literature is so powerful. And if we can just absorb ourselves, just read one verse, read the whole verse, purport, go back over it, read it again, see what you can understand, read it again, see the different meanings that are available. If you do that, you can give a class on that one verse. It becomes easy. You can give a whole class just on, on just, just studying one verse over and over again. It becomes easy. Like that. So this is Bhagavatam, and Sukadeva Goswami is known as the poetic, expre, expre, ex, poetic poet who gave the highest contribution. It was spoken by Sukadeva Goswami, who is a intimate associate of Srimati Radharani in the spiritual world. <clears throat> okay, so we'll stop here. Any questions, comments? Yes. Are you all right there, Gabriel? Hi. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, all right, do the needful. Hare Krishna. Uh, this title, Grantaraj, is it applicable only to Srimad Bhagavatam or other scriptures as well? Hmm. I've only heard it in relationship to Bhagavatam. Grantha means scripture. Yeah. Raj means the king. Grantha Raj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. We don't say that about other ones. We don't say it about Gita. Because we could say it about Chaitanya Charitamrita because we have two different statements by two powerful acharyas in relationship to the the topmost scripture. I think they agree, but they emphasize different ones. Just like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati would say, if all the all the books in the world were thrown into the rivers, and there was only Bhag only only Chaitanya Charitamrita left, there would be no loss. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, if all the books in the world were burnt and only Srimad Bhagavatam was left, there would be no loss. So both say about Bhagavatam, but Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, in the real sense of the transcendental nature of the scripture, they're both exactly the same. One in, one is one is about Krishna, one is about Lord Chaitanya, and both are the same person. So Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita is the living Bhagavatam. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, you should read Chaitanya Charitamrita before you read Srimad Bhagavatam. 
Interesting. And if you read the Bhagavatam, what is the first thing you read when you pick up the first canto? Who knows? Huh? Before the before the verses actually start. Yeah, it's a summary of the life of Lord Chaitanya, 60 pages. Prabhupada put that first. Because that's what his Guru Maharaj basically said that actually. Now one who reads Chaitanya Charitamrita first, only that person can understand Bhagavatam. Interesting. <clears throat> so, yeah, but these two scriptures are the main scripture to Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Chaitanya Charitamrita and Srimad Bhagavatam, both full of transcendental nectar. <laughs> and uh, we could read it all day. Sometimes we just feel like, oh, well, forget about everything. Let me just read. <laughs> we should do that sometimes. Devotees have been doing these, uh, what they call japa retreats. We should also do reading retreats. It's nice. A nice way to spend a kadasi is like you, you begin your japa, you chant for some time, you stop, and you read scripture for a while, and you go back to chanting, and you read, and then you chant for some time more, and then you stop, and then you go back to, then you start reading again. And this way you go back and forth like this the whole day. If you just try to chant japa all day on a kadasi, Unless you're Sheila Haridas Dakor, it's not so easy. I mean, there is devotees who have done 192 rounds on the Kadasi. I know that for sure. Most of them are Russian devotees. <laughs> and I have a disciple, and she was chanting, she's, in, she's actually from Croatia, she's in Mayapur. She's been there for about 10 years now. Probably, you know, you'd probably know her. her yeah, Vrindavan Aishwari. She chants uh, every day 32 rounds. She was chanting every day 64 rounds for years. But then uh, she had, people were giving her different services, so she felt obliged to do service, so. So now she chants 64 rounds on a codicy and 32 rounds every day. <laughs> so she's pretty fixed in Krishna consciousness. So yeah, there's, uh, there's an ocean of transcendental nectar here. Okay, any other comments or questions? Anything back there, Mr. Natko? Matt Go. He needs a microphone. Where did Dave Arish go? Oh, he's working too. <clears throat> oh, oh, with his business, huh? Oh, one of his, oh, okay. We offer our respects. Yeah. Hare uh, Krishna, this is a question from Boyan Boyich on Facebook. The question is, um, is uh, servitude uh, to, this, to one's own mind a dhyatmika vritti? or slavery to one's own mind, adhyatmika vritti, is it so? Mm, he wants to know the meaning of the term? Uh, uh, I, I guess so. Uh, he wants to know if, uh, if, if one is a slave uh, to one's own conception, one's own mental conception, is, is that adhyatmika vritti? I'm not sure I know the translation of that terminology. Mm, you have to look it up. But 
yeah, if you're if you're serving your mind and you're serving, you're becoming controlled by your mind. Anything you serve, you become controlled by that. But I don't really know the translation, the actual translation of that terminology. So we'd have to look it up in the database. How's it spelled? Adhyatmika. Adhya oh, Adhyatmika. Oh, no. Adhyatmika means uh, miseries of the body and mind. Yeah. Adhyatmika, Adhidaivika, Adhibhautika. Three forms of kleshas or miseries. So, Adhyatmika means uh, miseries that come by way of the mind and, by and the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. So the mind is giving you trouble, the body gives you trouble, other living entities give you trouble, higher powers give you trouble, coronavirus gives you trouble, political leaders give you trouble, barking dogs give you trouble, mosquitoes give you trouble, ghosts give you trouble. So many different living entities and different forms of ways you can become Affected by misery in this world. Yeah, so many. So Adhimika simply means troubles coming by the body and mind. All you can do is tolerate those. The mind gets tired, the mind gets depressed. The mind gets, uh, what we say, restless. Mind gets angry. Mind starts to lament. The body, we all know about the pains of the body. We don't have to mention those. Nobody can understand another person's bodily pains, but everybody can understand their own. <laughs> Okay, anything else? <laughs> okay, you feeling any better? Okay, good. All right, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam, Ki Jai. We're a little tired today, so class was a little sleepy. It's okay. <laughs>